Let me then ask you to return to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8. And we might choose for our text there, verse 11. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. The words of the Lord Jesus. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And seeking God's word, uh, God's help, we would like to meditate profitably upon his word from this text this evening. This is a busy chapter here. As I mentioned in the introduction, the Lord Jesus Christ had just delivered arguably the best sermon ever preached and he had come down from the Sermon on the Mount and he performed a number of miracles. He uh, healed a leper and he healed the centurion servant uh, from which our text comes from. He also healed Peter's mother-in-law who had a serious fever, cast out many demons and the calming of the storm, something that we looked at one Lord's Day uh, previously. And then he had the incident with the Gadarene demoniac. But we want to look at uh, these words that came out of the mouth of the Lord Jesus as a result of the great faith shown by the centurion. And Christ marveled at the faith displayed by the Roman centurion and predicted there will be many more like him in the kingdom of God. The title I'd like to give to our meditation tonight is Christ Predicts Success. Christ Predicts Success. That many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Well, I would like to highlight five things with you from this text. Five headings, I don't intend to be too long, but there are five things that I'd like to highlight from this text. The first thing we have here is a crowd. It is the crowd. Jesus says that many shall come. That many shall come. When we come to the house of God and when we come to the preaching of God's word, every one of us wants to hear something from God's word that's relevant to us, to our own particular situation. Whether we articulate this or not, I'm sure if we're a serious Christian, when we come to the house of God, and particularly when we come to the preaching of God's word, we want to hear, is there a word from the Lord? Is there a word? Well, we hope there is a word from the Lord for us this evening. We can come to the house of God and there may be times when we are despondent and downcast. And there may be many things that cause this in our lives. But if we're serious Christians, and if we have the cause of Christ in our minds at all, if we care for his church, and if we care for his cause, there must be occasions when we are somewhat depressed. When we look at the, the state of the professing Christian church, when we see small congregations getting smaller and smaller, when we see the state of the professing Christian church and as we see the apostasy, the decline, the clension, it's all around us. Now many people say that Christians have, well, they've got their mind in heaven. and But no, that's not really true of Christians. Most Christians really are realists. They have their feet firmly set upon this earth here. We don't say we're earthly, but 
We are practical, we are realists, we can see the situation. And it may well be that when we look at the church, and then when we take another look at the nation and the nations, and when we see the decline, the obvious moral decline that has come about because there is a great spiritual decline, we can well, well be somewhat downcast. Well, this word here from the Lord Jesus tells us quite clearly, friends, that many shall come. Many. How can we define that many? Well, I don't think we can define that many. But when Jesus Christ says that many shall come, you better believe it. Many shall come. He is not in hyperbole here. He is not exaggerating. We are not ones who um, look upon the words of the Lord Jesus in red, like some people have their Bibles where the words of Christ are in red, and we, we, sp we pay special attention to the words that the Lord Jesus Christ utters, because we firmly believe that the whole of the Word of God is the Word of Christ. But what we have here is the Son of God standing publicly, telling everyone, and it's recorded for us here in the Word of God for us, that many shall come. Many. And therefore we have a crowd here. And what he's telling us, many shall be redeemed from the east and the west. Again, this is not defined for us. But what we're meant to realize here is, how far is the east from the west? We cannot measure it. You cannot measure it. And what he's saying basically is that the people will come from all corners, all sections of the world. They will come. Many will come. And that surely is something that should encourage the people of God. We trust that tonight many of us are in the kingdom of heaven, or as the Bible would call it on other occasions, the kingdom of God. But many others will be in that kingdom. And the centurion is but a sample or a foretaste of that many. He had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he demonstrated that faith. He had a, a servant who was gravely ill, and he made a petition, approached the Lord Jesus. Luke would tell us, actually, that he sent the Jewish elders to approach Jesus. He didn't feel he was worthy in of himself to approach the Lord Jesus. And then when the Lord Jesus said he would come and the centurion saw Jesus coming, he sends out others. Go and tell Jesus, there's no need for you to come personally. Just say the word and my servant shall be healed. He had faith in the Lord Jesus. Faith so much that Jesus marveled at it. And he uttered these words as a result of it. Now, here we have the Lord Jesus saying that many shall come. Now, does this contradict what Jesus said on other occasions? We have made reference to the Sermon on the Mount. We didn't read it, but we have made reference to it. But in chapter 7, Jesus says things that might sound to us to be contrary to what he says here. In chapter 7, verse 14, for instance, he's talking out about how the straight and narrow, how difficult it is, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now that might seem to contradict what Jesus says here, but he says on another occasion, few will find it. And again, in, a, in chapter 7, very solemn verses towards the end of the chapter, verse 21 to verse 23 of chapter 7. 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many, 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 will, it says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. I never knew you. So the many who were doing wonderful things, supposedly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, one day, that great day when we will stand before him, that great day he will disown them and he'll say, I never knew you. Does this then contradict what we find here when he says just really moments after that many shall come from the east and the west? Well, we're not inclined to believe it does. Jesus would not contradict himself. Both things are true. Both things are true. Few there be that find the way. Few that find that narrow way. But on the other hand, many shall come, he says. Many shall come. And there are many scriptures that would support this. Let me quote one or two. Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, it talks about the Lord Jesus like this. For it became him, for whom are all things, that is Christ he's talking about, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. The Lord Jesus Christ will bring many sons unto glory. This was to encourage the Hebrews not to turn their backs on Christianity, but to lay hold on eternal life and to continue to follow the Lord Jesus. Why? Because he will bring many sons to glory. That's what he will do. That's his job. He's a savior. That's his mission. And in Jude, only one chapter in Jude, but in verse 14, it talks here of Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. Away back in Genesis, in the time of Enoch, Enoch the prophet, he saw, what did he saw? He saw indeed the Lord Jesus coming with ten thousands of his saints. Many shall come. The book of Revelation, a book taken up with end times, but a book that was very practical and very beneficial for first century Christians who were suffering persecution. In Revelation chapter 9, chapter 7, verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. Here they were in heaven. What were they doing? They were worshipping the Lord Jesus Christ. John saw this vision and what a vision it would have been and how it would have encouraged the first century Christians who were being slaughtered because they belonged to the Lord Jesus. He saw a great multitude which no man could number. No man, no computer could number it of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues. There's one other one that I want to quote. And of course, when we go to the Word of God, friends, the more we spend time in it, the more we have to realize and take notice of the words. The words, because they are conveying something to us. Again in Revelation, in Revelation 21 and verse 24, here we have, it's again looking at the end, and the nations of them which are saved. Did you notice that? It said, and the nations of them which are saved. He's not just talking about people. He's not just talking about individuals. He's talking about nations. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. They shall be in heaven. Nations shall be saved. What do we have here? That many shall come from the east and west. 
There are promises in the Word of God for us to encourage us as, as we're here as a small company of God's people and there'll be others tonight doing exactly the same as us gathering as small companies and we're wondering how we're going to survive or we're wondering how the cause of Christ will prosper in these days friends many shall come from the east and from the west they'll come because Jesus Christ will call them they will come and therefore we are to be encouraged but he says we're talking here about this crowd that will come but he's talking to a crowd in front of him who will not come a crowd in front of him who will not be saved the text goes on that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness who were they? they were in front of him the children of the kingdom were the Jews the gospel came first to the Jews salvation is of the Jews and they were there and they were going to reject the Lord Jesus Christ and they were going to be thrown out of the kingdom and it would not be wrong to say that the Jews would look upon the kingdom of God as something that was actually set up for them they thought they had a divine right to be in it and therefore for them to be told that they will not be in it while those the Gentiles from the east and the west that they'll be there but not the Jews themselves we are not Jews we are Gentiles but this could well be applicable to ourselves and to our nation is it not true that we have enjoyed we're talking here as a nation we've enjoyed the blessings that the Jews in their day enjoyed the gospel the preaching of God's Word the law the gospel the Bible all the benefits of divine revelation we as a, a nation have known that for centuries and yet we as a nation are turning our backs upon it now I repeat we're not Jews but surely uh, the principles we can extract from this and apply it so many blessings so much opportunity so much gospel being preached so much Bible so much commentaries so much uh, Christian influence and teaching and history and we are just turning our backs upon it we hope there is none here we want to be in this crowd this crowd who will be in the kingdom of heaven secondly and maybe I've touched on it in my first heading but I do want to impress upon you secondly the certainty of it the certainty of it Jesus says I say unto you that many shall come many shall come it doesn't say it might happen he doesn't say I hope it happens he doesn't say I anticipated he says many shall come here God has spoken to us in his word God is speaking to them in the crowd many shall come you see this the kingdom of the children of God shall be taken out those who thought they were going to be there will be taken out they will not go into it but many shall many shall it's absolutely certain and we can say this to ourselves this evening friends the success of the gospel is guaranteed it's guaranteed does not Isaiah 53 tell us that he shall see the travail of his soul and he's talking there the prophet is talking about the Messiah he's talking about Jesus Christ he shall see the travail of his soul and what is it going on to say 
and he shall be satisfied? Do you think Christ went to the cross and he will not be satisfied? Do you think that his blood shall be wasted? Do you think all his sufferings avail for nothing? All that belong to him shall come from the east and the west. They shall come because Jesus Christ will call them. By his spirit they shall be called. And therefore this should encourage us. It should encourage the minister. It should encourage the, the office bearers. It should encourage the ordinary Christian. We may be a small group. We may be despised. But nevertheless, there shall be a great number, and they shall come, and it is certain. If there's anything certain in this world, it is this. People talk about the certainties of, of this world. What are they? Death and taxes. Well, they may well be certain, but this is a certain. Many shall come. But there's another edge to the certainty. It's not just that they shall come and many of them shall come and all whom Christ has died for shall come, but the security of them. All these people that will come and they come in various ways. Ordinarily, it is through the preaching of the gospel. They come to services like this and they hear God's word being proclaimed and the Holy Spirit drives that word into their hearts. What happens? They begin to realize they're sinners. They begin to realize something of the terror of the Lord and they're not right and ready to, fit, to meet God. And they know conviction of sin and this might go on for some time. We cannot tell. Everyone's different. But then they come to a point in their experience when they see what God has done for them in Christ. And they close in with Christ. They believe upon him. Once they could never believe upon him. But God by his spirit regenerates them. And they begin to believe upon the Lord Jesus. And they know peace and happiness because their sins are forgiven well, friends, these persons who have been called and converted and saved, they shall be brought to glorification. Oh, they might go up and down. They'll have their good days and their bad days. They might backslide. But Jesus Christ will save them. He will go after them. He will lose none of his people. And therefore, the gospel is guaranteed it's a certainty to succeed and he will redeem all his people even the most sickliest Christians shall be saved not because of them not because of their efforts and that doesn't mean to say we don't have to make an effort but ultimately salvation is of the Lord and of him alone thirdly the comfort that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down. They shall sit down. When Jesus went into heaven, he sat down. He sat down. No high priest ever sat down in the temple. Why? Because his work was never finished. There was no seat in the temple for the high priest. It was work, work, work. It was continually offering sacrifices. Day after day after day, he had to offer these sacrifices. And they were all pointing to that glorious sacrifice of the Son of God when he would offer up himself. And now in heaven he sits at God's right hand. Uh, Hebrews again, chapter 10, verse 12. But this man, that's talking about Christ. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And those who come into the kingdom of God, there is a sense here and now that we sit down. We sit down from our efforts for trying to save ourselves. We sit down from trying to get right with God by our own actions. 
We recognize that we're saved by grace. Oh yes, we know we have to fight the good fight of faith and we have to war against the, our own sinful nature and against the world and against the evil one. We know we have that fight, but nevertheless, there is a sense of comfort because the battle is over in some sense. And then, of course, in the full manifestation of the kingdom of God in heaven itself, where the church triumphant is, there's no battle, there's no fighting. None whatsoever. The war is over. They sat down. Christian, you know something of this. Your days of unbelief were days of rebellion. The days when you fought against God, when you hated Him and when you despised Him. But when you were converted, all change. The old days are gone. There's now a peace, there's now a, a comfort. And that comfort will come to full fruition in the, in the end and the final manifestation of the kingdom of God. Fourthly, we have the company and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They are the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, we know something about them because their lives and their actions have been revealed for us in the Word of God. They were far from perfect, but they were men of faith. They had faith and they fought the good fight of faith. And they're in the kingdom of heaven now. And friends, if we're going to be in the kingdom of heaven, we need to be like them in this sense that we need to have the same faith. Abraham is the father of the faithful. And that's the company that we belong to if we're in Christ Jesus. Abraham saw Christ's day and rejoiced in it. And so did these other brethren. So did all the Old Testament saints. They were looking forward to that day when Christ would come and when he would perform what he did. Whereas New Testament Christians, we look back to what he did. That's the company. Now whatever we'll say about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the rest who are in the kingdom of heaven this evening, there's one thing that marks them out and they are holy individuals. Holy and without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And as we've said earlier, these men were not perfect, but they were holy. And as they went through their life of faith, they became more and more holier. And if we're going to be in that kingdom of heaven, this must mark us out. Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That's the company. But the one we worship and adore is Jesus Christ. Again, if we think in the book of Revelation, it talks about heaven. It talks about the scene in heaven. In Revelation chapter 4 and verses 10 and 11, it talks about the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne. Who's that sat on the throne? It's none other than Jesus Christ. And worship him that liveth forever and ever. And cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. It will be good to join with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, David, Solomon, Samson, others. But Christ will take the center stage. That's the, that's the company. I'm reminded about one gentleman in the open air. I was talking about heaven. 
And he honestly said to me, I don't want to go to heaven. I don't want to go. Why not? Because there's holy people there. And he recognized he wasn't holy. And he didn't want to be in that perfect place because he knew that by his life and by his actions and by the way that he thought, he wasn't ready, he wasn't fit for it. And it was quite profound because he's absolutely spot on. People say they want to go to heaven, but very often it's a heaven of their own imaginations. If you're not fit for heaven, you will not enjoy heaven. These individuals had to be changed. Otherwise, they would never enjoy heaven either. Lastly, fifthly then, the country. In the kingdom of heaven. We've called it a country. The kingdom of God here he's talking about in its, what we might say, its full manifestation. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is set up now. And we would say that the kingdom of heaven is the rule of God in the heart of the individual. And there are people in the kingdom of God here and elsewhere all over the world. But one day that people will be gathered together to be in one kingdom and it will overthrow all the other kingdoms. And there will be no other kingdom but this kingdom, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And one and the men mentioned it basically in prayer. A new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That is ultimately the final manifestation of the kingdom of heaven, the eternal state. Many shall be there. Many, Jesus says. The point for ourselves tonight is, will we be there? The only way to get there is to have Christ as Lord and Savior. To be in Christ. To have our sins forgiven. To be reconciled to God. To have that new life. To know what it is to be born again. To crucify the flesh. And to be found in Christ. That's the only way. Many shall be there. We hope, trust, that all here and all listening, that we'll all be there. Otherwise, it would be better that we were never born. Amen. And may God bless his word to us. Let us pray.